Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. Welcome back to Biochemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing all about this molecule over here on the far right, which is dimethyltryptamine, also called DMT. We'll see later on that it's a psychedelic molecule. We'll talk about its biological effects, but we're going to first talk about how it's made, its biosynthesis. Now, dimethyltryptamine is only biosynthesized in plants. It's not made by mammals. And here's its biosynthetic pathway right here. So we begin with this amino acid, which you've seen before, tryptophan, right? This is one of our 20 proteinogenic amino acids. Now, in plants, it can be decarboxylated by this enzyme right here, aromatic amino acid decarboxylase, sometimes just abbreviated AADC. This enzyme removes this carboxyl group right here. And so we're left with just this amine up here, okay? Now this enzyme, indolethylamine and methyltransferase, or INMT, this is going to use the methyl group from SAM, or s methionine, to methylate the amine group twice. Okay? Remember that SAM, or s methionine, is really the universal methyl group donor. So it requires two molecules of SAM, one for the first methyl group, and a second for the second methyl group. And so the overall effect of that is we get this amine dimethylated. And that's really where we get the name of this molecule. This right here is tryptamine, but if we methylate it twice, we have dimethyl tryptamine, or DMT. Okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Now this dimethyl tryptamine being synthesized in plants, it's not by all plants, it's by specific genera, which include Phalaris, Delosperma, Acacia, Desmodium, Mimosa, Varola, and Cycotria. Over here you can see an example, Cycotria viridis, and really it's the leaves here that contain the most amount of the DMT. And so uh, whenever it's being prepared, the leaves are often ground up and it's made from that powder that comes from those leaves. Okay, so that's how DMT is biosynthesized. Now, of course, um, humans have been known to take this recreationally. Now, we're going to start by talking about the metabolism here before the effects because we need to understand one important aspect of the metabolism. So look right here. This is dimethyltryptamine up at the top. Okay. Now, when you take any kind of pharmaceutical, it doesn't matter what it is, okay, there's a metabolic route for degradation. If you have a way to either make something or ingest something, there has to be a way to get rid of it. Now, in general, there's two major pathways to get rid of dimethyltryptamine in the body. Uh, the first one is the one that involves the liver, and this is actually the minor one, just so you know. Now, in the liver, we have these enzymes called P450s. I'm not giving the specific uh, isoform of the enzyme, um, but P450s are going to be able to sequentially demethylate this nitrogen up here. Remember, it has two methyl groups. It's dimethyl. So one P450 reaction can convert dimethyltryptamine to monomethyltryptamine. Notice here, uh, one of those methyl groups has been removed. And then another P450 can remove the second methyl group. And when that is removed from monomethyltryptamine, we just have tryptamine. So the significance of this pathway is it really just leads to inactivation. Okay, it doesn't do anything for excretion or elimination of the drug. And by excretion slash elimination, we mean either through the feces or through urine. Okay, tryptamine is really not eliminated in the urine, so this pathway really doesn't do anything for elimination or excretion. All it really does is leads to sequentially inactivating DMT. Monomethyltryptamine is less active than DMT, and tryptamine is even less active than MMT. Now the other pathway over here, which is the rapid pathway, and also more prolific, it's more important for DMT metabolism, is that of monoamine oxidase, or MAO. Monoamine oxidase is responsible for uh, oxidizing and completely inactivating a lot of different type of aromatic amines. So for example, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, these all undergo metabolism through one of the monoamine oxidases. Okay? Now, if you look over here, you can see that whether we have DMT, MMT, or tryptamine is irrelevant. Any one of these three molecules uh, can be metabolized by MAO, monoamine oxidase, and they all give the same product. It's over here. This is indole acetic acid, sometimes abbreviated IAA, indole acetic acid. 
So again, you don't even need these P450s for a complete metabolism of dimethyltryptamine. These really just give you some partial inactivation. Uh, but these pathways right here, monoamine oxidase, it can metabolize any one of these three, and it leads to complete inactivation. The reason it's complete inactivation is we've completely changed this functional group from an amine now to a carboxylic acid. And the other reason this is important is because this carboxylic acid uh, makes this molecule uh, susceptible to being excreted. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So in order to get this molecule excreted, we really need this amine converted to a carboxylic acid, and that's the job of monoamine oxidase. Now, other than monoamine oxidase being the most important pathway for degradation of DMT and providing a functional group here that allows for excretion and elimination of the metabolite, the other important thing clinically about monoamine oxidase is that it's so prolific and so rapid that if you were to take DMT orally, which is the primary mode of administration, by the time this gets to the liver, monoamine oxidase is gonna get rid of all this before it has a, a chance to have a biological effect. In other words, you start taking this, particularly slowly and in, in low, moderate doses, when it gets to the liver, monoamine oxidase gets rid of all of it. So if you wanna have a biological effect, you have to either take a really massive dose of this, which is not advisable, or you have to have some way to bypass the liver. Now, of course, inhalation or injection is an option. However, if your mode of administration is oral, your option is to take an inhibitor of that enzyme. Okay? So here's a, a partial look at that pathway from the previous slide. So we can look at DMT going to MMT with P450s. This is so slow, we really don't even care about that. We care about this. Okay? So if we want to have DMT be able to go to the liver, and not get converted to indoleacetic acid, in other words, not get metabolized by MAO, and be able to get into the bloodstream as DMT, then we're gonna need an inhibitor of monoamine oxidase. And so many times with DMT administration orally, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor is taken concurrently. And so these are both gonna to go to the liver, the DMT and the monoamine oxidase inhibitor, and that monoamine oxidase inhibitor inhibits monoamine oxidase, so therefore that DMT is gonna be able to stay in the blood longer and it exert a psychedelic effect, okay? The only other options would be to either take a massive dose, which again is not advisable, or to change the route of administration to something like inhalation or injection or something like that. If it's taken orally to bypass the MAO, it's taken with an MAO inhibitor, it's normally either natural or it is synthetic. Now, in terms of DMT's effects, it mainly exerts its effects by binding to serotonin receptors. Okay? Now, you can read all about these receptors right here. Um, these are the most common receptors that DMT is going to be able to bind to in the body. Here's a table of their binding affinities. Remember with these values, the lower the value is, the tighter the binding and the more pronounced the effects. These are going to be the receptors that DMT binds the tightest to. Uh, this one, 0 0.075, the 5-HT1A receptor, or the serotonin-1A receptor, this is going to be the, the receptor uh, through which DMT is going to exert its effects most, just based on that binding affinity. Down here we see something with an affinity of 22. Uh, the dopamine transporter, it's really not going to bind to that, so we're not going to expect any effects to be exerted through the dopamine transporter. So the lower these numbers, the tighter the binding is. Now these are just physiological responses. If we consider the experiences that people might have while subject to DMT, it's gonna be things like profound time dilation. Things are going by slowly. And also distortions and hallucinations that are visual, auditory, tactile, and proprioceptive. And also some people have the perception of being able to sense hyperbolic geometry or impossible objects while on DMT. Now, one thing that's important to understand is that, one, uh, the effects of these are very subjective. Okay, so that's why a lot of these are just an opinion based on the person who's, in, who's taking the, the drug and also uh, the context in which they're taking the drug. That's also very important, so very subjective. And the other thing is a guy named Rick Strassman also found that uh, the effects also depend on the degree and type of the dosage. So lower dosages or doses of DMT are probably just going to affect emotional responses and tactile sensation. Okay, so these things like tactile and proprioceptive distortions. Okay, 
Um, you're not necessarily going to have hallucinogenic experiences on lower doses. On higher doses, however, there's going to be these intensely colored, rapidly moving display of visual images, formed, abstract, or both. And I bolded the visual just because the visual hallucinations are more common than auditory hallucinations overall. There's also sensations of body dissociation, euphoria, calm, fear, anxiety. You can see these four kind of contrast with one another, but again, that's just because it is a subjective experience. Depends on the person, depends on the context of the usage. And also other subjective findings include the ability to communicate with other intelligent life forms and a sense of another intelligence being described as either super intelligent but emotionally detached from the situation. So these are the general effects of DMT. But the key is that they're subjective and they exert their effects mainly by binding to these serotonin receptors. Again, that 5-HT means serotonin. Okay, so we just talked about the metabolism of DMT and the major mode of metabolism is through monoamine oxidase to this molecule, indole acetic acid. Now, the indole acetic acid has two metabolic pathways in and of its own. One over here on the left, this larger pathway over here, where we actually have several branches, this is the conjugation pathway. And this actually occurs through human enzymes, and this is in the liver as well. Okay, We'll talk about that in just a minute. The other pathway is through gut bacteria, so the, the intestinal microflora, and they have an enzyme called indole acetic acid decarboxylase. And that's essentially just going to remove this carboxyl group from indole acetic acid. And now we have this molecule over here called scatol. Scatol is eliminated in the feces. Okay, and it's actually the primary smell of feces is this molecule scatol. And by the way, this is not the only metabolic pathway that leads to scatol. There's a lot of things that produce scatol, uh, but this is the, the major player in the smell of feces. Interesting thing there. But this is done through gut bacteria, not human enzymes. Now the other pathway over here does occur in humans. This is in the liver, so hepatic enzymes. And th these are pathways generally to conjugate indole acetic acid to other chemical moieties, which allow them to be more water soluble, and therefore they can be excreted in the urine. So other than this reaction going over here to the left, we won't worry too much about that. Uh, we'll go over here, and we can see that indole acetic acid can be conjugated to an amino acid. This is aspartate, or aspartic acid, if you like that. And this automatically increases its solubility. Uh, but what you can see here is that in, in addition to that aspartate, you can get a carbohydrate that's attached to this nitrogen on the bottom of the indole ring. Okay? Um, Basically what this molecule is, is a glucoside that just happens to have an aspartate on this carboxyl right here. It's now an amide linkage. But again, you have a bunch of functional groups here, carboxyl, carboxyl, and an entire sugar that increase its water solubility. Over here, there's no aspartate present, so all that happened was indole acetic acid was conjugated to that sugar on this nitrogen down here at the bottom. Okay, And that also increases that water solubility. Now this pathway, as I said, occurs in the liver. It also occurs in the kidneys. So if you're occurring in the kidneys, you're already set. You're already in the right place to secrete into the tubule system, and then it goes into the urine, right? If you're in the liver where this is happening, then these are simply transported in the blood to the kidney, and then they're secreted into the tubule system, and they're excreted in urine, okay? So if it's done in the liver, which is the primary location, It'll just transport in the blood, which is okay because now we've increased their water solubility. They go to the kidney, secrete it into the tubule system, and now they're in urine. So hopefully this video gave you a good overview of dimethyltryptamine. We looked at its biosynthesis, we looked at its metabolism, its biological effects, and the remainder of its metabolism and its excretion. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.